Thanks for tuning in to the IGM podcast. We're so glad you've decided to explore God's word with us. We look forward to connecting with you in email at info at or online at our website, www.integritygm.com. We hope this podcast encourages you to grow in the knowledge of God through his word. Be blessed. Welcome, everybody, to this podcast, and I want to greet you in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, in the name of Jesus, the Christ. Today, we are going to be looking at a New Covenant survey. Before we start looking at the individual books of the New Covenant, I want us to look at things from a broad perspective and looking at the author, the date, the occasion of every single individual book of these 27 books of the New Covenant Scriptures. I want to look at them from a broad perspective and just give an overview of them, just little bits of information just to share with you. But first of all, I want to talk about the intertestamental time, as some people call it. That's from Malachi or Malachi all the way to the birth of the Messiah. The last book that is in the Old Covenant scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, in the rabbinical system and also in Protestant Christianity is the book of Malachi or Malachi. Malachi was written around 433 to 430 B.C. And Yeshua, Jesus, was born in 5 B.C., Some people get confused about that date. They say, wasn't he born in the year zero? That was the plan when they were developing the calendar. And as they were developing the calendar, they were looking back on history, trying to pinpoint the exact date of Jesus the Messiah, the birth of the Christ. They were off for about five years in their dating. So when we look at it today, historically, we're looking at 5 B.C. Herod the Great died in around 4 B.C. Jesus would have had to have been born before that time. So anywhere between 4 and 6 B.C. is the birth of the Messiah. So when we look at Malachi all the way to the birth of the Messiah, you have around 428 years of time span that so much is happening and someone wrongfully labeled this the silent years. And they are not the silent years. In fact, this is setting the backdrop and the background of everything of the new covenant of what Jesus is being born into, the life and the faith of the Jewish people. And so I want to spend a little bit of time in these 428 years looking at what is developing politically from a literary standpoint and from a religious standpoint because most of the things that we see in the time of Jesus do not exist during the time of Malachi or prior to that time. So where did it come from? How did these things develop? Now I want to start with Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream of four empires that will come, that will saturate the earth and dominate the earth. We know those empires as the Babylonian Empire because Daniel's going to interpret this vision, this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. He's going to give him the dream and then interpret the dream for him. You have the Babylonian Empire, then you're going to have the Medo-Persian Empire, then the Greek Empire, And then the Roman Empire is going to be the fourth empire. And in this dream, these four empires are going to dominate the world. But then part of this vision is a fifth kingdom that was not cut out with human hands that's going to come and hit the fourth kingdom, that Roman Empire. Now, Rome is never named within this whole dialogue. We do have the understanding of the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, and the Greeks. But this fourth kingdom is not specifically named, but the Roman Empire is this empire that comes on the scene as this fourth terrifying beast that we read in Daniel, say if you look at Daniel chapter 7, and it will saturate the world, but there is going to be this little rock or this stone that was not cut out by human hands that's going to represent a fourth kingdom that's going to come and hit that fourth beast or that fourth 
part of the statue, and all of man's kingdoms will be destroyed. Man's kingdoms will rise and then they will fall, but this rock that hit that fourth kingdom will be a kingdom that will never, ever be destroyed. We understand this as the kingdom of God. In Daniel chapter 7, we're going to see that this kingdom is given by God to the one like the Son of Man. And this kingdom can never be destroyed. It's an everlasting kingdom. And all authority and dominion will be given to the Son of Man. And He will rule and reign forever. This is prophesied in the book of Daniel by the prophet Daniel. Now, in the Hebrew Scriptures... Daniel used to be understood as a prophet, but later on, because of the significance of the book of Daniel, he was taken out of the prophets and put into the writings. But Daniel was a prophet of God. So I'm starting there to explain the political background, because the Babylonian kingdom functioned or ruled from 609 to 606 all the way till 539 B.C., Then at 539, Cyrus and the Medo-Persian Empire becomes the world power and takes over from the Babylonians. And from from 539 all the way to about 333 B.C. with the rise of Alexander the Great, from 333 to 330 B.C., we have the Greek Empire, the third part of that statue, or the third beast, that's going to come up quickly and saturate the earth. And we see after Alexander the Great dies that his four generals inherit the Greek Empire. Then about 169 BC, one of the emperors of the Greek Empire, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, as he is reigning, comes into the land. And in 164 BC, He is going to go into the temple of God, take a statue and erect it to Zeus, and sacrifice a pig on the altar of God. This was understood in one way as the abomination that causes desolation. From that point, there is an uprising that takes place within the land of Israel or within this land that's under Greek authority, a Jewish man named Mathetius and his five sons rise up against this Greek oppression, and they start a revolt against the Greeks because of what had taken place in Jerusalem and how Antiochus Epiphanes IV was trying to saturate the land with pagan worship. They rise up and start a rebellion that leads to an actual taking back of the land and a sovereignty within the Jewish people back in the land again. This is known as the Hasmonean dynasty that comes out of this revolt. And for about 100 years, from from 164 B.C. all the way to 63 B.C., you're not going to have a world power, but in the land of Israel, you're going to have limited or sometimes complete sovereignty of the Jewish people to rule themselves. The Greek Empire continues. Now, during this Hasmonean period, as the Greeks are ruling the world, but there is sovereignty within the land where the Jewish people are actually ruling themselves, the fourth kingdom arises, the fourth part of that statue, and it happens in around 63 B.C. In 63 B.C., the Hasmoneans bring in the Romans, who have been on the scene for some time, but bring them in to settle a dispute that's taken place within the Hasmonean Empire. And during that time, they settle the dispute, but the Romans do not leave. And so the Romans stay in the land, take charge, and they are the world power that comes on the scene during that time that begins to dominate the world. A few years later, in the land, there was... The Edomites. Now, the Edomites were forced into Judaism during the Hasmonean period. But there was a dynasty among the Edomites that made an alliance with the Romans. And a man called Herod, or the title Herod, Herod the Great, becomes the puppet government within the land underneath the Roman Empire. That happens in 37 B.C. 
It was Herod the Great that killed the babies in Bethlehem. It was Herod the Great that's going to remodel the second temple that was built and dedicated in 516 B.C. to God's glory. He is going to be the greatest builder in the history of Israel. Not only is he going to remodel, and some say rebuild the second temple, some look at it as a third temple, as Herod's temple, but he's going to build Caesarea. He is going to build a pagan temple in Samaria or up on Mount Gerizim. And all around the land, you see paganism that is being built by Herod the Great. He loved the Greek culture. He loved the Romans. He was pagan from the heart, yet he wanted to be the king of the Jews. And any threat to his kingdom, he was extremely brutal, like most of these empires and most of these dynasties of that day. So when Jesus was born, Herod the Great was the king of the Jews in the land. Shortly after that, we know that he died out. But the Herodian dynasty continued. So at the time of Jesus, as he is growing up, well, first of all, he goes into Egypt to escape from Herod the Great. Later, after his death, he comes back and he settles in Nazareth. And we see the Herodian dynasty continuing through the family of Herod. And that is the political environment that the Messiah was born into. Now, let's look at some of the literary background. Something incredible takes place in that intertestamental time that we refer to that 428 years. In around 250 B.C., the Hebrew Scriptures is translated into the Greek language. It is known as the Septuagint. And the Jews that were in the diaspora or the diaspora, many of them, their first language was the Greek language especially in Alexandria, Egypt. And the Greek language was the world language. It would be very similar to English today. Anywhere you go, there are people that know English. And sometimes if they do business from one country to another country, English is the connecting language. That was how Greek functioned during that time frame. So you have the Greek Old Testament, the Greek Old Covenant, which was the Hebrew Scriptures that was translated in 250 B.C. In fact, when we get to the time of Yeshua and the temple that was in Jerusalem, the temple had a copy of this Greek Hebrew Scriptures, Hebrew Scriptures translated into the Greek language. Josephus writes, it's the greatest literary work the world has ever known. So Greek has become very important not only to the expansion of the gospel later on, but for the Jewish people around the world. You also have, during that time period of that 428 years, you have writings that are known as the Apocrypha. You have the Pseudepigrapha. These are Pseudepigrapha's false names given to writings. The Apocrypha were works that developed during that time frame, and in, that, in these writings you have much of the development as we look later on. We're going to talk about the religious development, about a Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes, the Zealots, and etc. and so forth. You have in these writings the development of the historical background that's going to lead into the New Covenant. Now, in Orthodox Christianity and Roman Catholicism, they keep the Apocrypha as part of the Hebrew Scriptures or part of the Bible. In rabbinical tradition, the canon of the Hebrew Scriptures starts at Malachi. And in Protestant Christianity, we do not recognize the Apocrypha as the Word of God. We just recognize them as good historical books that developed during that time frame. We look at these books and we understand that they were important for that time in the understanding of these 428 years. There's 14, some say 15 of these books in the Apocrypha. Also, I want to say a few words about what we know today as the Dead Sea Scrolls. There was a community called the Essenes, 
And the Essenes had left Jerusalem, many of them, not all of them, because of the corruption that was in the priesthood during the Hasmonean dynasty. During the Hasmonean dynasty, the king took not just the kingship, but he also took the authority as the priesthood. And the priesthood was extremely corrupt. In fact, the priesthood could be bought for a price to serve as the high priest in Jerusalem. Sometimes the Hasmonean kings became both king and priest at the same time, which could not be done according to the law. In fact, there's only one individual scripturally that can be both priest and king, and that is the Messiah. And we see that from a scriptural standpoint. Because of this corruption in the priesthood, a group of Jews moved out near the Dead Sea in what is known today as the Qumran community. They discouraged marriage, but they did not forbid marriage. They were out in the desert waiting for the coming of the Messiah. During this time frame, they began copying the scriptures in the Hebrew language. Even some of the fragments in which they copy are from the Paleo-Hebrew, the original script of the Hebrew language. I believe that there are four fragments in that Paleo-Hebrew in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We look at what they were writing. They were copying the Hebrew scriptures They were copying some of the Apocrypha, some of the Pseudopigrapha, and a lot of their writings is about the communal writings of their community. They would baptize themselves every day, waiting for the Messiah. Some people mistakenly call them the first Christians. In fact, that's what they're referred to sometimes in the land of Israel. Well, these were a sect that became the forerunners of Christianity. That is not the correct understanding of them. However, they were very messianic. There was an expectancy of the coming of the Messiah. In some of their writings, they write that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. He will open the eyes of a man born blind. He will cleanse the leper. He will do it all. It's an incredible understanding of how they were waiting for the Messiah, and they were expecting him to come soon. We see the Hebrew scriptures being copied. Now, later, many of them are going to be destroyed, ripped apart by the Romans, However, today we have a lot of the fragments, and what's so incredible, we have the complete scroll of Isaiah, Yeshuahu, that is intact today, that you can see where they copied the whole scroll of Isaiah that did not get torn apart, and it's not in fragments, but it is complete. So I just wanted to mention some of the literary aspects. You had the Greek Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures translated into the Greek language. You had the Apocrypha developing during that time. You had the Essenes at the Dead Sea copying the Hebrew scriptures and copying other things that we can get a hold of today to read. So there was a literary context that was developing. I think the most important thing for us to remember is the Greek language is saturating the world. And when the new covenant is being written, the new covenant writers are looking back to the Septuagint, the Greek old covenant scriptures, because Hebrew as a spoken language had died out at that time. Hebrew was being read within the synagogues, but normally explained in Aramaic. It was a mixture of Hebrew and Aramaic, but the world language was Greek. Even in the land of Israel, the educated and those involved in business, like the disciples up in the lower Galilee and the upper Galilee, they would have had to have known Greek because that was the Galilee of the Gentiles, the nations, the trade routes came through that area. And so if they were going to do business, they at least needed to know simple Greek. And so the Greek language is the language of the world at that time. Now let's look at some of the religious background, or I would say the religious background in which the Messiah was born into. During the Hasmonean dynasty, several things developed that are so crucial to understanding the new covenant worldview. During that Hasmonean dynasty, which was extremely political. Now remember, this is from 164 all the way up to 63 B.C. There was a Sanhedrin that developed. 
that started off as a political party, but it was taken over by religious parties fighting for the political power within the Hasmonean dynasty. So this Sanhedrin, this religious council developed, and there were two main groups that were fighting for power. One was known as the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the priests. They were the Kohens. They were the ones in charge of the temple. And remember, the temple had become extremely corrupt during that time. Now, some of the theology behind the Sadducees was that they only believed in the first five books of the Bible as the Word of God. They didn't really believe in the supernatural. They didn't really advocate miracles. They did not believe in angels. Most importantly, they didn't believe in an afterlife. They were all about today. What can happen today? What can I accomplish today? Because after we die, that is the end. And they became very hedonistic. It's all about me and what I can get for myself. We see the Sadducees, the priesthood, trying to take control of the Sanhedrin. Also, for the first time, we have a group called the Pious Ones. They're not priests. They're known as Pharisees that have developed a group that they have the traditions of the elders and they possess these traditions and it's going to be known as the oral law. Now, all the way through the Hebrew scriptures, there's not any mention of a oral law. There's not any tradition about ruling concerning consensus. And the Sanhedrin is going to operate on this consensus understanding whatever is the decision made by the Sanhedrin is binding upon the Jewish people. The Pharisees said that they have an oral law that was passed down from Moses to the 70 elders, to Joshua, from generation to generation, and they possessed the interpretation of the written law of Moses. In fact, later on, they say no one can keep the written law, but if you keep the oral law, you are fulfilling the written law or you are fulfilling the requirements of the written law. So this concept of the oral law is coming on the scene. This is extremely important because they say two laws were given to Moses. One, the written law, and also the interpretation of the written law. And that has been passed down from generation to generation. And now these pious ones, these Pharisees, have formed a group. They possess the oral law. And whatever they say must be binding upon the Jewish people. These are rabbis. These are teachers. They say prophets have died out. And they are the possessors of the law. They have the oral law. They have the interpretation of the written law. And what they say must be adhered to by the Jewish people. They control the synagogues. Where the Sadducees control the temple, they control local places of worship that began to develop during the Babylonian exile, going back a few hundred years earlier. This idea of a local place of worship to study the law of God developed during that time, and then the rabbinical system, and then the Pharisees is going to come out of that. So when you come to the time of Jesus... When Jesus battles against the Pharisees, he is not battling the written law of Moses. He is actually battling the traditions of the elders, the oral law, that the Pharisees say that they have the right interpretation of the law. Let me move on to the Essenes. I've already mentioned them prior with the Dead Sea Scrolls. But the Essenes were Messianic They did not believe in the priesthood in Jerusalem. They did not submit to the Sanhedrin that was being battled between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Their biggest community was out by the Dead Sea, known as the Qumran community, and they were waiting for the Messiah. It is believed that John the Baptist had interaction with the Essene community. In fact, in one of their scrolls, there is a controversy over a man named John who was killed by Herod. Now think about the difference between the Essenes and what John the Baptist was preaching. The Essenes were baptizing themselves every day 
to get purified and to get clean and wait for the coming of the Messiah. John the Baptist probably had interaction with them and said to the Essene community, you're doing everything wrong. It's not about getting clean outwardly to get ready for the Messiah, but it is a baptism of repentance that if you get your heart right with God, then you will clearly see the Messiah when he comes. So John the Baptist takes him away from the baptismal tanks that was clean water, goes down to the muddy Jordan, and he begins to preach a baptism of repentance. And it says in the Word of God that all of Judea flocked down to the Jordan River to hear John the Baptist preach. And he preached a baptism of repentance. One day as he was baptizing, he saw Yeshua coming from a distance. When he saw him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. He is recognizing Isaiah 52 and 53 and saying, This is him. This is the suffering servant of Yeshuahu, of Isaiah, the one who came to lay down his life as a ransom for many. The one that will be a lamb that is led to the slaughter, this is him, behold the lamb of God. Two other groups I want to mention quickly. There were the zealots. The zealots were more of a political group that their whole thrust in life was to get rid of the Roman domination within the land also to get rid of the Greek language, get rid of the Greek culture, which is known as Hellenism, and their whole focus in life, and they were terrorists, that they would go and attack and do terrorist acts against the Romans, and they were highly successful, so they terrorized the Romans during the time of Jesus. Jesus even had one of his disciples that was known as a zealot. I'm going to mention one other group the Herodians. You see the Herodians that are mentioned. The Herodian dynasty that started with Herod the Great in 37 BC, he again became the great builder, probably the greatest builder in Israel's history, even greater than Solomon and everything that Solomon built. And you look at the Herodian dynasty, there were actually groups of Jews that believed that Herod the Great and his dynasty should be followed and that he was the king of the Jews. We see the Herodians that were on the scene at the time of Jesus. Now, the Herodian dynasty is going to die out with King Agrippa II that is mentioned at the end of the book of Acts, who is the great-grandson of Herod the Great. And we're going to see that dynasty finally die out. So let me mention these groups again. You have the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes, the Zealots, the Herodians. You have the Sanhedrin, the religious council that is being fought over by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then you also have the synagogue that is so important that when you look at these local places of worship where they would pray, read the scriptures, and they would teach the word of God that almost in every community that you had Jewish people around the world, you would have a synagogue where Jews would gather in order to listen to the word of God. So this is some explanation of what's happening during those 428 years. Politically, Babylonians, Medo-Persians, Greeks, the Hasmoneans, the Romans. From a literary standpoint, the Greek Old Covenant Scriptures, the Apocrypha, the Dead Sea Scrolls. From a religious standpoint, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the Synagogue, the Essenes, the Zealots, the Herodians. All of these things have developed during those 428 years. When you go back into the Hebrew Scriptures, what we know as the Old Covenant Scriptures, you do not see these things. You do not experience them, say, in the book of Samuel, First and Second Samuel. You do not see them in First Kings, Second Kings, First Chronicles, Second Chronicles. These are things that developed during that intertestamental period, which is giving the backdrop and the background that Jesus, the Messiah, is born into that world. And as we study the New Covenant Scriptures, you're going to see... All of this background, almost in every book, 
have a bearing of what is taking place within those letters and within those books, especially within the Gospels. You see this backdrop that is so important when we're dealing with the context of the Gospels. Now, what I would like to do within this survey is just give you a chronological unfolding of the New Covenant Scriptures. Remember, Yeshua, Jesus, was born in 5 B.C. Luke's Gospel says around 30 years of age he began his ministry. That's around 25 A.D. If he ministered three, three and a half years, we do not know that from a scriptural standpoint. If he did, then he was probably crucified around 28 A.D. at Passover. And we see the life of Jesus, however long it took place, or say the ministry of Jesus, that that time frame, we see the Gospels unfolding. But the Gospels are going to be written later. When you look at the book of Acts, the book of Acts is beginning around 28 A.D., that we see that the early believers, the Jewish believers, the 120 that are gathered on the day of Shavuot, Pentecost, in Jerusalem, waiting for what the Father has promised. He has promised the coming of the Holy Spirit. Jesus has died. Jesus has been resurrected. He was on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. He has ascended back into the heaven, witnessed by these Jewish people. They are waiting for 10 days in the city of Jerusalem. And on that 10th day, God pours out his spirit upon the believers. And all 120 of these Jewish people that were known as Galileans were filled with God's spirit. And then Peter, Petros, on that day gets up and preaches and preaches and proclaims that Jesus is the Messiah who died and rose from the grave and he's alive today. And 3,000 Jews within Jerusalem take water baptism. That is really the birth of the community of faith because it has come alive by the promise of the Father, the coming of the Holy Spirit that is indwelling the believers. Praise God. From the book of Acts then starts at that time frame in around 28 A.D., and it's going to go all the way to about 63 A.D. Most of the New Covenant scriptures are going to be written during that time frame. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of the backdrop of each letter and how they unfold it chronologically. Some of these, there's a little bit of debate especially in the Gospels. The Gospels are some of the hardest to date. But I just want to show a chronological unfolding of the Scriptures and look at who wrote these letters, who are they writing to, and what is the occasion. Just answering probably three or four different things concerning each book. The first letter that was written in the New Covenant Scriptures chronologically, according to conservative scholarship, is Jacob. Now, most of you have never heard of Jacob. We call it in the English culture, James. But it's actually his name is Jacob in Hebrew, Yaakov. So the three main disciples of Yeshua, of Jesus, is Petros, Yaakov, and Yohanan. We look at Jacob as we would pronounce them in English, his name in English today. His letter was written between 40 and 48 A.D., We will study this letter first. He is writing to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. And we'll talk in detail concerning of who he's writing to. So it is the leader of the Jerusalem church that is writing to scattered Jewish believers. He is the half-brother of Jesus. He is known as Jacob the Elder. Even Josephus talks about Jacob and his great reputation that he had in the city of Jerusalem. Now, we're not going to go into more detail than that, but once we study the book, we'll go in, in depth to everything about this letter. The next letter that is written is written by Paul, and is written to the Galatians. Galatia was a region. This letter was written around 48 to 49 AD prior to Acts chapter 15. Some would say that it was written shortly after. I put it shortly before, and we'll talk about that, of why I put it shortly before the Jerusalem council. Paul 
is writing to Gentile believers. His Hebrew name was Shaul. His Greek name was Paul, or how his name was pronounced in the Greek-speaking world, in the Roman world, was Paul. He is writing to Gentile believers, confronting Jews that have come from Jerusalem and saw that they were not circumcised of the flesh, and we won't go into that right now. And he's writing back to them what is the true gospel and who has cast witchcraft on you, who has bewitched you to go to a different gospel. And so that is the letter that Paul wrote to the Galatians. The third and fourth letter is First and Second Thessalonians that is dated between 51 and 52 A.D. These letters are written to the believers at Thessalonica who were very gullible, written by Paul, written to Jewish and Gentile believers to straighten out their understanding about the coming of the Lord and the end of the age. The next letter that is written, the next two letters, this would be number 5 and 6, around A.D. 55 and A.D. 56 is First and Second Corinthians, again written by Paul to the believers at Corinth, dealing with all the factions, all the bad teaching, the immorality that is in the congreg- congregation, the divisions, everything that was going on, the misuse of spiritual gifts, and in Second Corinthians, the defense of his life, his ministry, and his apostleship. The seventh letter that was written is the great letter that we should all know, the letter that Paul writes to the Romans. And this is written around 57 A.D. In 57 A.D., he writes this beautiful letter as he's on his way to Jerusalem. It's going to take him about three years before he finally arrives in Rome to believers that he has never ministered to, but he wants to go to them on his way to Spain to have some fruit and some ministry, some spiritual fruit among them. During this time frame, from 55 to 60 A.D., we have the first gospel, the gospel of Mark. Right after that, in 60, 63, we're going to have Matthew and Luke that is written. All three of these gospels are known as the synoptic gospels or the parallel gospels. 60 to 70 percent of the material that is in Mark is in the gospel of Luke. Close to 90% of all the material that is in Mark's gospel is in Matthew's gospel. But please remember, all three of these gospels are emphasizing different things about about the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus and the death and the resurrection. Mark's gospel is actually written from Peter's sermons that were being preached in Rome. And this is John Mark, John Mark that we see that accompanied Paul and Barnabas or Barnabas and Shaul on the first missionary journey that got scared and and left them and went back and, and gave up on that missionary journey. There was such a dispute between Paul and Barnabas on the second missionary journey. Barnabas wanted to take him. Paul said no, that they had to agree to disagree and they went their separate ways. And Barnabas took John Mark. John Mark became part of Peter's ministry. And later, he is going to write the first gospel. He really emphasizes the miracles that Jesus did and that Yeshua was the servant of the Lord. When you look at Matthew's gospel that was written between 61 through 63 AD, written by one of the apostles, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, Matthew Levy or Matthew Levi. He is writing from a Jewish perspective, a Jewish background, writing to the Jews, showing that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Hebrew scriptures, that he is the Messiah, and he is more interested in what Jesus said. He put an emphasis on his preaching and on his teaching more than what Mark did. Mark is putting more of an emphasis on the miracles. When we go to Luke's gospel, Luke's gospel is the first volume of a two-work project, Luke and Acts. And in this gospel, Luke is the only Gentile background believer 
who had come to faith. He was a medical doctor, and he traveled with Paul for many years. He is going to emphasize Yeshua, Jesus, the Son of Man, and showing how the gospel has come through the covenant relationship with God from Israel all the way to the Gentile world. He's emphasizing more of the humanity of the Messiah and how God has brought the gospel to the whole world. He also emphasizes at the end of his gospel the promise of the Holy Spirit, which is setting up the second volume of this project, and that is the book of Acts, which is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. So you have all three of these gospels developing fairly close together, Mark being first from 55 to 60 AD, Matthew and Luke between the time frame of 60 and 63 AD. Also, during that same time frame, you have four letters that are being written by Paul that is being written at a time in which Paul is under house arrest within Rome between 60 and 63 AD. And you have Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon or Philemon. He is writing under house arrest. These are known as the prison letters. He is writing from Rome. He is writing to the believers at Ephesus. In fact, Ephesus at Ephesus is at it later. It's more of a circular letter that is going out to the church, the believers, the community of faith in general. One of the most beautiful proclamations of what is the body of the Messiah, written by Paul to the church in general around the world or around that area in which he's writing to in Asia Minor. We see the letter written to the Philippians. We see this letter written as an expression of his thanks for the gift that they have sent to Philippians. The main theme of it is about rejoicing. And you see that the church at Philippi, the believers at Philippi, became the first community of faith within Europe. And you see that in Acts chapter 16. And this was a wonderful body of believers that developed, that loved God and loved Paul and his ministry. And they send him a financial gift there in Rome. And he's writing back to them about rejoicing and to have joy. I think the word rejoice or joy is used 16 or 17 times within this letter. You remember, this is where the song comes that says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You also have the letter that is written to Colossae, to the Colossians. Paul had never been to Colossae, But that congregation probably developed out of the ministry and the community of faith in Ephesus. And there was a heresy that is developing in Colossae that we'll go through known as Gnosticism. And we'll go through that in detail that he's writing back to them and to correct them about their wrong teaching within the Colossae church. Also, you have this little letter to me that is one of my favorite books in the whole Bible, the letter written to Philemon. And it's written by Paul to Philemon about Onesimus that came to faith during Paul's ministry in Rome while he was under house arrest, who was a slave, and Philemon was the slave owner, and how he brings about reconciliation and does what is right and does things the right way. And he tells Philemon, do not take him back as a slave but receive him more than a slave. Receive him back as your brother. Praise God. Then we see in 63 AD, the book of Acts, which is the second volume connected to the gospel of Luke, written by Luke, who is a Gentile believer that is following Paul, that is ministering with Paul, that is writing about the acts of the Holy Spirit. Most people in your Bible, you have the acts of the apostle. That is not the right title. I would say the more accurate title for this book is the Acts of the Holy Spirit because this book is more than just the apostles. It's about the works and the acts of the Holy Spirit that came upon the believers there at Shavuot at Pentecost and how for 30 to 35 years 
that the Holy Spirit is taking the believers and spreading the gospel all around the world. The book of Acts is a history of the early church of about 30 to 35 years, from 28 A.D. all the way through 63 A.D. Now, after the book of Acts, there are still several letters that are written. And I'm going to look at these letters here very quickly. First and Second Peter, written between 63 and 65 A.D., written by Peter, the main apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have your three main, Peter, James, and John, Peter, Jacob, and John. Peter was the one that was always a fighter, always striving to do what is right, always falling down and coming up short, and how God continued to use him and how Jesus continued to pick him up and talk about a day that he would do great things for God. So you have Peter that is writing from Babylon, probably a pseudonym for Rome, could be from Rome, writing to the church and the believers. The first letter is written about the persecution that comes from the outside of the church against the believers. The second Peter, his second letter, is about the internal conflict of false teaching coming from within inside the body of Christ that is probably coming from Gnosticism that Paul is also going to write against in Colossians. And there's another letter that's written during that same time frame by Jude, who is the half-brother of Jesus, that's dealing with the same subject of 2 Peter. In fact, when you read 2 Peter and you read Jude, they almost seem like identical letters, dealing with false teachings coming within the body of the Messiah, probably connected to Gnosticism that we will talk about. And this letter was written also between 63 and 65 A.D. During that time, same time frame from 63 to 67 A.D., you have three letters of Paul, his last three letters, because after his two years under house arrest in Rome, He is let loose, and from history, we understand he goes on a fourth missionary journey all the way to Spain. You remember in that seventh letter of the New Covenant Scriptures, the letter that Paul wrote to the Romans, he talked about, I want to come to you on my way to Spain. He actually made it all the way to Spain according to history. But during those four to five years, he's going to write these three letters. They're known as the pastoral letters. I don't believe that is the most accurate title for these uh, letters. But he's going to write 1 Timothy, Paul to Timothy. He's going to write to Titus. And then he's going to write a second letter to Timothy right before he is killed and executed in 67 A.D., Paul is going to be executed in Rome by Nero in 67 AD. He's going to have his head cut off. And one year later, Peter is going to be crucified upside down in Rome as well by Nero. But from 63 to 67 AD, you're going to have Paul's personal letters as an apostle writing in apostolic authority to Timothy and to Titus or Titus about the local body of believers and how it should function. And we're going to look at those letters as well. Second Timothy representing his last letter right before he dies. Now, one more letter that is written before 70 A.D. 70 A.D. is extremely important, but it is the time in which Jerusalem and the temple, the second temple that was built by Zerubbabel, some people call it Herod the Great's temple, is going to be destroyed by the Romans. Just like Jesus, 40 to 42 years earlier, said not one stone will be left upon another. However, there's one more letter that is written before that great historical date, and that is the letter written to the Hebrews. From 65 through 68 A.D., during the vicious, brutal, systematic persecution of Christians by Nero throughout the Roman Empire. By that time, the believers were called Christians. And if you named the name of Christ, you could lose your property. 
You could be put into jail. You could be executed, just like Paul and Peter were executed during that time. He took Christians and hung them on crosses and set them on fire. He blamed them for the fire at Rome. He blamed them for every social ill within the Roman Empire. This is how much Christianity, this Jewish faith, had spread throughout the Roman Empire. And the writer of Hebrews, that we really do not know exactly who it is, the first person that was mentioned as the author was Barnabas, around 200 A.D. by Tertullian, one of the early church fathers. Later on, Paul was mentioned after the 4th century. Not many people today in scholarship would consider Paul the author of Hebrews. However, this letter was quoted over and over in 2nd and 3rd and 4th century. It was considered part of the New Covenant scriptures that had apostolic authority. And this letter is written by Barnabas or Paul or Apollos, written to Jewish believers that they cannot go back into the Old Covenant and have their identity with God once the New Covenant has come. It is finished, it is finalized, and there is only salvation through this New Covenant that comes in Yeshua and in Jesus' name, in Yeshua's name. This is between 65 and 68 A.D. There are three letters that are written specifically to Jewish background believers, and that is Jacob, Matthew, and Hebrews. Now let's go to after 70 AD. We're going to wind this up. We have the writings of John, the Johannian writings. We have the first letter of John, the second letter of John, the third letter of John. At this time, he is the only disciple that is left. You remember you had Peter, Jacob, and John. You have 70 A.D., you have the destruction of Jerusalem, and you have the destruction of the temple. Over a million Jews are killed, and Jews are scattered around the world. You have John that becomes an elder and is the last apostle that is alive, and he writes these three letters. And it is also dealing with Gnosticism. Because as the gospel is spreading to the Greek-speaking world and the Hellenistic world, Gnosticism is the world philosophy. And as people are getting saved, people try to bring their philosophies into the community of faith. And John's going to have to talk to them, write to them about what is the true gospel. So you have 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. Also, you're going to have the gospel of John. And the Gospel of John is different from Mark, Matthew, and Luke. It's not even written in chronological order. Now, this is the disciple that is described in this Gospel as the disciple in whom Jesus loved. And there was a special bond and love between Yeshua and Johanna and Jesus and John. And there was this bond that even made Peter jealous at times. And we're going to see that in the Gospel of John. But he's going to write this gospel, not in chronological order, but he's going to write to the believers that you may truly know who Jesus is, the Son of God, one with the Father, and there's only salvation in his name. And he's writing that you might believe in him, and by believing, you will have life in his name, that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And that is his whole focus in this gospel so that you might know truly who Jesus is versus the Hellenistic view of Gnosticism. And then we have at the end of his life, we have the book of Revelation, not Revelations, but the Revelation that God gave to John when he was in exile in prison on the island of Patmos about the 70th week that was spoken of Daniel about what is going to happen at the end of the age. How is all of this going to come together? And John is going to see a vision at about the same age that Daniel was when he wrote his visions or wrote his book about his visions. You're going to see John write about 
this great revelation that Jesus is going to give to him about the seven churches of Asia Minor and about the end of the age, how the 70th week of Daniel is going to unfold. And as we go through the book of Revelation, the last book of the New Covenant Scriptures, we're going to compare it to Daniel and Ezekiel and Zechariah and Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, etc. and so forth to see what is actually taking place in the book of Revelation. These are the 27 works of the New Covenant Scriptures. We're going to study them chronologically. We're going to see them from how God spoke to the author, to whom they are writing to, the recipients, what are the occasions, what is the historical background, and we're going to understand the original intent of Scripture. And what God said through that individual to those people is what he's going to be saying to us today. This is the Brit Hadashah. This is the New Covenant. After the death of John, there wasn't any writing later on that would be considered part of the New Covenant Scriptures. All of these scriptures had to be written by the apostles or have the authority, apostolic authority over them, accepted over these writings. You see in the 2nd century, the 3rd century, the 4th century, all of these writings are quoted by the early church fathers. So when they come into the 4th century deciding what represents the canon of the New Covenant Scriptures, these are the 27 works that were said to be of the apostles or approved by the apostles, the New Covenant canon. This has been one hour that I have given a little bit of an overview about the background of the New Covenant Scriptures. The next podcast that we will look upon or try to bring to you will actually be going into the Scriptures. So through this podcast, we have been looking at the broad context. Now we're going to be looking at the specific context, and we're going to be looking at the letter of Jacob, of James, and we're going to go through it chapter by chapter as much as we can, verse by verse, and hopefully this will be a great blessing to you. I pray that this podcast and all of this information is a great blessing to you. Let it just be a foundation of your learning of the things that we talked about today. And you need to do more in-depth study of everything that I talked about today. God bless you and have a wonderful day in the Lord. If you'd like to learn more about IGM or have any questions about this podcast, feel free to reach out to us at info at integritygm.com and connect with us on Instagram at integrity underscore global and Facebook at integrity global missions. If you like our podcast, please share it and leave a review. Thank you for listening. Have a blessed day.